Thank you. Uh, we are honored to be here with you today. This is exciting for me because this is my area of research. Uh, I'm, I've looked around the room some today and I think I've cited papers by some of you, so. Uh, but I haven't met you yet. Um, so this is exciting. And uh, not only that, I get to shamelessly promote our students. So a couple of these guys are looking for jobs. I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, anybody that's hiring, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to point them out. Um, Mr. Clark mentioned a few things here that uh, I was going to say up front, so uh, I'm glad that's out of the way. But we also have with us down here Clint Davis is the president, CEO, president and CEO of uh, Commercial Bank and Trust Company in Paris, Tennessee, as Mr. Clark already mentioned uh, at the beginning. So we're glad to have him with us as well. I sense that my microphone just came on. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you heard that. Sorry. Um, we have with us three presenters. Uh, as he already mentioned, also two students were not able to join us. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about each one of these guys. Dan Hoffman, sitting immediately to my left, uh, graduated back in May. He is working for the Tennessee Department of Treasury, already doing very interesting things. Ben Arnold is still an undergraduate. He'll graduate in December with a whole lot of majors and minors because he wants to go sit for the CPA exam and needs the 150 hours, but he'll be, he'll be looking for a job. Cole Hollis down at the end, uh, graduated back in May as well, and decided to stick around and get an MBA. So he's one of our graduate assistants, and I know our MBA director is thrilled to have him. He's doing an excellent job there as well. And I'm Dr. Mark Farley, um, been at the University of Tennessee at Martin for, this is my fifth year. I've been involved with the case study for three years now. And this has been one of the highlights of, of my interaction with students. So thanks to CSBS for hosting this. We really enjoy it. Uh, as I mentioned, I represent UT Martin, the College of Business and Global Affairs. And uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on at UT Martin is that we try to make sure and provide a lot of our students experiential learning opportunities. We want them to get hands-on experience in different contexts. Uh, real world experience, uh, because a lot of our students are lacking that. And uh, frankly, we try to get them as much as we can. So this type of experience for them as an ex experiential learning opportunity is very important to their education. And frankly, gives them experience that a lot of students come out of college and, and don't have, as many of you know. Uh, so we're thrilled with that. One of the other things that's unique about the University of Tennessee at Martin is, and I say unique, it's fairly unique because some universities have dedicated chairs of banking, and we're one of those. We have uh, an office called the Dunnigan Chair of Excellence in Banking that Mr. John Clark, back in the back, not to confuse with Mr. Charles Clark here, Mr. John Clark helped endow that chair, uh, helped to form that chair. What, how many years ago was it, Mr. Clark? 40 years? 40 years ago. Uh, he, he is recently retired in the last few years and has come and is serving as the chair of that banking office now that he helped create all those years ago, having served on the board for many years. Mr. Clark is uh, excellent to have as a resource at UT Martin because he does a lot of things that kind of go unnoticed. Uh, but one of those things is that he just knows West Tennessee and bankers in West Tennessee very well. And so when we approach this case study competition, one of the things that, uh, that he provides an excellent resource for is he's able to look at the rubric and the topics and he, he has banks that pop in his mind uh, pretty quickly. And he engages people in those conversations early on. And so this, the bank that, that sponsors us in this competition that we work with very often has a good story to tell in those topics. And of course, that's a great place to start for us. We don't have to manufacture anything to make this work. And so we're really happy about that. Uh, the partner bank, as I mentioned, Mr. Davis is down here. I'm going to let him introduce a little bit of information about the Partner Bank and some of the people that worked with us uh, there at the bank. Thank you. So as, as Dr. Farley said, we, uh, we partnered with UTM and this team through this project. It was a uh, phenomenal experience. We were really excited to, to have the opportunity to, to participate in this. Uh, we've been fortunate to work with UTM over the years several different times. Uh, we do some scholarships through UTM related to banking. Uh, and then also have, have, have had the benefit of hiring some, some UTM grads that, that, that have worked and work uh, with, with our bank. So it's been a great partnership uh, and, and, and this has been a great experience for us. 
wanted to share some of our team that, that helped uh, with this process, uh, work through the interviews and some of the correspondence with, with the team this spring as they, as they prepared uh, th this paper. Uh, Brett Stutes is our CFO. Uh, he's been with us for about four years. Uh, Jennifer Starks is our HR director and, and obviously this has, had an HR component to it. Uh, so she was, uh, was, was very beneficial in providing some information through this. She's been with us for about five years. And then Scott Freshy is our chief IT officer. He's been with the bank for about five years as well. Uh, Mott Ford is our, our chairman and CEO, CEO of the bank. Uh, he's been with us and, and been in that position for the last 28 years. Um, so uh, again, just a great experience for us. We had other bankers that were involved with this process with the UTM team. And then also actually engaged a couple of clients as, as part of this process that wor worked through the interview process with, with these folks. And uh, really commend the CSBS for, for, for doing this program. Uh, after being in it and seeing it, you can see the benefits and, and the real world experience that Dr. Farley, Farley mentioned. Uh, so again, we, we just appreciate the opportunity and had a, had a great time working with this team. I'm going to speak a little bit on the financial aspects of our paper, starting with earning performance and liquidity. Uh, Commercial Bank and Trust has many diverse non-banking revenue streams that they have. Uh, it includes their trust department. They have a finance company subsidiary as well as a wealth management branch. And those non-banking non streams account for 35% of their total revenue in 2022. And the bank is investing into those non-banking revenue streams heavily as you can see that non-interest income has increased by 77.6 percent from 2018 to 2022. With liquidity the bank employs a rather conservative approach to that and they like to keep around from eight and a half to ten percent of their total assets in cash or cash equivalents. That number has been increasing since 2019 With the loan portfolio, portfolio composition, it has, the percentages have remained pretty constant since 2018. Commercial loans did see an increase in 2020 and 2021. It was mainly attributed to the 1,504 PPP loans that they issued, and those loans totaled $103.4 million. The commercial loan percentage is now trending back toward the pre-COVID numbers due to all but one of those the PPP loans being closed. Asset growth has seen 140% increase in their investment portfolio from since 2018. And most of those have been invested in safer securities such as tre treasury and agency backed bonds. With capital levels and planning for that, the bank is a subchapter S corporation, which allows them certain flexibilities that the Subchapter C corporations do not have. The tier one capital has grown 43% from 2018 to 2022. And the tier one capital ratio has averaged 16% over those five years. And then Ben's gonna speak on staffing. Thank you, Dan. So going on to staffing, um, as an accounting and finance major, when I, I knew, knowing nothing about banking, Starting in on this competition, I, I was expecting it to be nothing but number crunching, nothing but Excel sheets. But as going forward, I realized it's not so much a numbers business, but a people business. And I guess I should have guessed that from the name community banking. So learning about that um, is really about relationship building. And you really foster that with the people that work at the bank, the bankers, the loan officers and really having them build that relationship with those customers. And in doing that, you also need to invest into those bankers, invest into those loan officers. And I think Commercial Bank and Trust does that really well by um, doing um, continuing education and also uh, doing stuff like this, working with the university and being able to learn a lot more about just banking, general banking issues in general. Going on from going about people inside the bank, investing in future bankers. Um, <coughs> banking, well, future bankers are the future of banking. Without future bankers, there is no more community bank and it's all going into a consolidated form. So really going to 
invest in maybe those college students doing, again, competitions like this, having those scholarships, and even internships, getting real world banking experience for those future bankers is it's essential to keep the community banking industry going forward. And with bringing those new people in, you're going to foster a, gener a uh, generational makeup into the bank. And the best way I can describe the advantage that this has is giving you a real world example that I faced recently. So my fiance and I recently just bought a house and we are changing the flooring out. And we looked at each other and we said, we have no idea what we're doing. We need some help in that. So my grandfather worked in construction for 40 years. He had that experience. So we had him help us, like tell us what to do, some tips and tricks and things like that. But when he changed his router out and all of his Alexa products weren't working, <laughs> guess who he called? He called me. So <laughs> whenever you have different age groups working, you have different skills. You have that experience on maybe the older, more, uh, the older generation. But when it comes to technology and maybe emerging markets and emerging platforms that younger generation can help balance that out so it does come with some conflict not understanding each other's generation but I think it gives a lot more advantages than disadvantages I'm gonna go over to Cole going about uh, uh, with his extent with the succession planning <laughs> thank you Ben so I'm gonna be referencing the people in banking as well similar to Ben but uh, for now I'm going to get into the largest proponent to why we believe commercial bank and trust is so successful, and that is because of its succession planning. Um, from everybody in this room knows that to make sure that succession planning is done well, it takes initiative and resources. And those, that initiative and resources was something that commercial bank and trust was willing to give. Um, and I'll talk on that later too. One of the largest proponents of their succession planning was focusing on outside talent. So not just people that understand banking, but from the employees on their executive team that are more recent, um, it was not just somebody that understands banking, but it's somebody that understands IT that understands banking, or not somebody that just understands people, but understands like that HR component to people and also banking. Um, and that's one of their largest successes. One of the best ways that I've heard it explained to me is it's like a company's like a bus and the people, the positions are like seats on the bus. And if you don't sit the right person in that open seat, the people around them won't get along with them. And the, you know, the culture of that bus will not be propelled forward. And the way that I see it is that those newer executives that were put into their seats, we heard many stories about how they meshed well into the culture and they just knew that of those available seats in their company, as opposed to the bus, they, they knew who they needed to fill them, and it was remarkable. Um, moving on to the technology and training section. So on the subject of development and post-pandemic flexibility, Commercial Bank, going back to not being afraid to spend those resources, knows that developing their staff members, be it new, or an existing senior staff member that just needs to be um, you know, taught about a more recent change in the realm of banking, they were ready and willing to spend those resources to prepare their employees. And we talk about banking as a um, people business because that's what it is. The post-pandemic flexibility that Commercial Bank wanted to provide was the in-person experience. Because without being in person, it's hard to connect with people. And they experience a lot of people coming into their bank to get that in-person experience. And they were ready to bounce back from the pandemic as fast as they could to get back into that in-person aspect of banking. Oh, and of course, reiterating the people-focused business. They, all of the changes that they make at their bank, be it an HR change or a technology change, it was with people in mind with the families that they've been serving for three, four generations, they, they thought of them first before they made those changes. And the chief information technology officer reiterated that many a times, be it a server change or cybersecurity preparations, both of those, any of those things was about the people first. And into the next technology points, we're gonna get into some of those technology improvements. One category, uh, Officer Freshy would call it consumer-facing. Um, 
one of the most recent changes at Commercial Bank was the offering of mobile banking. And to stay competitive in their larger markets, such as uh, Memphis, competing with larger banks, they knew that one of the biggest things they need to do is stay competitive with those banks, offer the same offerings. And they recently invested a lot of financial resources into making sure that they could stay competitive, make sure they're offering those clients um, what, they, what they seek. But almost arguably more important, the internal improvements. I, I mentioned it earlier, the cybersecurity, which we heard a little bit on that uh, sessions ago. They have upgraded their endpoint detection and they were making sure that the security that they offer their clients is top notch. Um, Officer Freshy mentioned that a lot of times he was not afraid to spend those resources to make sure that it was as top notch to serve those people um, as well as they could. And uh, phishing training for internal like employees. Um, he, he came up with a program, Officer Freshy did, on sending out those like mock emails to see what employees were clicking on the emails that they shouldn't be and uh, identifying those employees and training them, preparing them, and making sure that their security is, was top notch. Uh, but. So, what we learned. Uh, we came up with four C's of the case study competition and we took inspiration from the five C's of credit. But for our first point, I would like to lead it off to Ben. Yeah, so the first one we came up with was camaraderie and of course you would assume that yes there's camaraderie amongst the team and the faculty advisors but I would really want to focus on the camaraderie between the team and the bank because I really think that's where our team and our paper shine is getting that real close relationship with the bank and getting that real inside look that a lot of people will never even get the chance to have. Uh, Commercial Bank and Trust was really good about you know just opening their doors to us making us feel at home when we would visit and visit with them and also uh, giving us the opportunity to ask them just about any question that we could come up with and then uh, give us a timely answer and really help bring our paper to, paper to that next level. And also, and very similar to that, comes with the commitment, the second point. You have to be committed to write a paper in a case study like this. The countless hours involved in research and typing, editing, re-editing, and re-editing again, and the, the meetings and getting everything situated. It comes a lot with commitment from the team side, but also from the executive leadership of the bank side, um, being able to open, our door, open their doors up, giving their time and their effort and resources into helping us create a better environment for future community banks was a really important part of making this case study team really work well. Now going to community. Uh, to bounce back on community. <laughs> Uh, the first story that stuck with me after going and working with the executive team of Commercial Bank was a story about a local restaurant that was going to go out of business because of the pandemic. And they had told, I think it was Officer Stutes, that if it wasn't for a loan that they had provided them in a time that they needed, they wouldn't have stayed in business. And if that doesn't exemplify community, I don't know what does. And as well as just the holding the community together. Uh, it felt like every point that they made was about the people again, but community banks' role in that is making sure that they keep the local Paris community together, whether that be um, the farmers they've been serving for multiple generations or the people that just moved out to Paris, Tennessee. Uh, they were there to serve them in all things. Um, back to communication for Dan. So this case study really opened my eyes to communicating with professionals. I hadn't done much of that in my undergrad and just being able to see how much the officers at the bank opened up to us. They were answering our questions promptly and then us being able to take that and then being able to promptly respond to the faculty advisors and to each other, being able to reach out to each other for help on certain subjects and being able to communicate that well was really like instrumental in our in our case study. Uh, have Dr. Farley finish us off here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to add a fifth C: uh, collaboration, because I think there's a lot of people who are involved in this process for us, and of course we learn a lot as well. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. That's fine. Um, the, the the number of people who collaborate in this process is uh, uh, really extensive, and and you've seen most of those on the slides today. Uh, but there's some people we would really be remiss to, to leave out, and I don't want to do that. 
so number one, Mr. Clark, I already mentioned uh, Mr. John Clark, the head of, of our Dunnigan Chair of Excellence in Banking. Um, he, he's going to get tired of me saying this, but our, our former chancellor used to joke that, that Mr. Clark has really only been bad at one thing, and that's retirement. Because he <laughs> retired from uh, a bank that he led, or well, worked in various capacities and led uh, for a 40-year career, and then came to the university to continue serving the community. And he, so he's, of course, done a great job with that. Uh, he does so many things behind the scene that go unnoticed, uh, even down to raising money and, and creating scholarships and, and so many other things that serve our university in advance and promote it. Uh, so he's, he's our advocate, he's our champion, he's our sponsor, our patron. I could go on and on, uh, but Mr. Clark really deserves a lot of credit for our success. Uh, and so we're, we're of course honored to be here, but we're honored to be here with him as well. Um, next, Ms. Tracy Crawford is his assistant in that office. And she's kind of the glue that holds us all together. She makes sure we're where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing at the right time. And uh, we, we probably wouldn't accomplish much without her uh, either. Uh, in addition to her, Ms., uh, Dr. LaJuan Crawford, uh, excuse me, Dr. LaJuan Davis uh, is a business communication professor with us at UT Martin. And she helps with editing. The, the mechanics of writing, uh, these guys get it right because she reviews it. And uh, I also edit for content. In our first pass through these papers, uh, some of you have read student writing before. Um, <laughs> our first pass through these papers sometimes takes six to eight hours. Uh, the later ones don't, thank goodness, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of work. We, we were talking earlier when we were kind of running through this presentation about how many hours we would estimate going into this process. And we, we, we shake our heads, we don't have any idea, but it's a lot, it's very extensive. And uh, we're, just, we're just really thrilled with this process. And uh, I don't mind, again, shamelessly promoting them. We're the first university to repeat. So they get credit for this, for this repeat, because uh, they did a fine job. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and listening and the smiles on your faces make them feel welcome to be here and not nearly as nervous. <laughs>